Piliavin et al. 1969 Subway Samaritan Background In 1964, a woman named Kitty Genovese was murdered outside the apartment building where she lived in New York. A subsequent newspaper article two weeks after her murder claimed that up to 38 people, many of whom lived in the same apartment building, had seen or heard the attack, but had not called the police or come to her aid. In the years following her murder, a number of psychologists attempted to find an explanation for why so many people who had allegedly witnessed an emergency situation, such as murder, might not want to help. Some of the research conducted suggested that a concept of diffusion of responsibility could have been a possible reason. Diffusion of responsibility is where people spread their responsibility for a situation amongst other people who are also closely involved with the situation. Another possible explanation explored by psychologists was bystander apathy, which is where people believe that they don't need to do anything in a situation because they think someone else will. However, before the research conducted by Piliavin in 1969, these two concepts had only ever been tested in highly controlled laboratory experiments. Piliavin wanted to investigate people's willingness to help someone who was in need of immediate help in a real-life natural environment, where they weren't aware that they were being studied. In Piliavin's study, people who exhibited helping behaviours were referred to as Good Samaritans by the researchers, which is a term generally used to describe someone who is helpful or charitable. Aim. The study intended to find out how people would react if they saw someone collapsing on a train. There were a number of specific aims. One, to find out whether the perceived responsibility of the victim had any effect on helping behaviour. For the purposes of this experiment, the researchers decided to have two conditions, a victim who was blind and a victim who was drunk. The researchers predicted that a person who was drunk would receive less help than a person who was blind. Two, to find out whether the race of the victim had any effect on helping behaviour. The researchers predicted that help was more likely to be given to a victim of the same race as the helper. Three, to find out whether modelling would have any effect on helping behaviour. In the context of this experiment, modelling took the form of a confederate, helping the victim. Previous research had indicated that people are more likely to help if someone else does first. Four, to find out whether the number of people in the subway coach where the experiment took place would have any effect on helping behaviour. Researchers wanted to test the concept of diffusion of responsibility, specifically, the relationship between the amount of helping behaviour and the number of passengers. Sample. There were approximately 4,450 men and women who took part in the study who had used the New York subway between 11am and 3pm from April to June 1968. Approximately 45% were black and 55 were white. The sampling method was an opportunity sample. However, none of the participants were asked whether they wanted to take part in the study. Methodology The study was a field experiment that took place on various subway train journeys on the New York subway each of which usually took around seven and a half minutes each. The experiment had four independent variables. The type of victim, blind or drunk, the race of victim, black or white, the effect of the model or no model at all. This particular condition involved a confederate helping the victim either 70 or 150 seconds if none of the passengers helped them before that, or in the case of having no model, there was no modeling at all. And finally, the number of participants in each session of the experiment. This was a naturally occurring independent variable that was not controlled by researchers. The dependent variables were measured by two female researchers, seated in the area of the coach adjacent to the area where the victim was situated, which was formerly known as the critical area. These variables included the number of helpers, the time it took for help to be given, also known as latency, the race of the helpers, the sex of the helpers, the number of bystanders, any movement of passengers out of the critical area to near the victim after they fell over, any verbal comments made by passengers in reaction to the victim. Procedure The study included four teams, consisting of four researchers each, two observers who were female, and two males, one of whom acted as the victim and the other acted as the model. In total, there were 16 researchers. The victims consisted of three white male students and one black male student. In the drunk condition, they smelled of alcohol and carried a bottle of alcohol wrapped in a brown bag. In the blind condition, the victims carried a black cane with them. Apart from this, the victims dressed and acted exactly the same in both conditions. They wore US Army-style jackets and old trousers. 
The victim would stand next to a pole in the critical area of the coach, and after about 70 seconds after the train started moving, they would stagger forwards and fall over, remaining on the floor staring at the ceiling until they were helped by one of the passengers. If the victim was not helped by any passengers, then the model would help them to get up after either 70 seconds, 150 seconds, or once the train had stopped at the next station, depending on the condition being tested. The models consisted of four white males who were split into four conditions, standing near the victim and helping after 70 seconds, known as the critical area early condition, standing near the victim and helping after 150 seconds, known as the critical area late condition, standing further away and helping after 70 seconds, known as the adjacent area early condition, standing further away and helping after 150 seconds, known as the adjacent area late condition, and there was also a fifth condition with no model at all. The two observers both sat in the adjacent areas and recorded the dependent variables during the experiment. The researchers would conduct between six to eight trials per day. Results. The study found that 95% of blind victims received help spontaneously from other passengers, compared with 50% of drunk victims receiving help from passengers. The results also showed that help was offered much more quickly to blind victims, with a median of just 5 seconds, compared to 109 seconds for drunk victims. On 60% of all trials, help was provided by two or more passengers, and of these, 90% of the first helpers were male, despite 60% of the passengers being male. 64% of helpers were white, which could be predicted based on the average racial distribution of the carriages. The study found no significant difference to helping behaviour, but there was a slight tendency for same-race helping, especially in the drunk condition. There was found to be no strong correlation between the number of bystanders on the train coach and the speed of helping behaviour, and the results found no evidence of diffusion of responsibility. They actually found evidence that showed the opposite. Response times tended to be faster with a large group of passengers compared to a small one. The models were rarely needed during the study, since the public were usually quick to help on their own within the given timeframes. In instances where modelling occurred, the effect of modelling was found to have less of an impact on helping behaviours after 150 seconds compared to 70 seconds. The longer the victim lay on the ground, the more likely it was that passengers would leave the critical area, especially in the drunk condition. On 21 of the 103 trials carried out, a total of 34 people left the critical area. Most comments made by bystanders were made during the drunk condition. A number of comments were obtained from female bystanders who explained their reasoning for not helping. These included, It's for men to help him. I wish I could help him. I'm not strong enough. I've never seen this kind of thing before. I don't know where to look. And, You feel so bad that you don't know what to do. Conclusions One of the main conclusions that the researchers drew from the study is that individuals who appear ill or disabled are more likely to receive help in emergency situations than someone who appears to be a victim of their own behaviour, i.e. someone who is drunk. With mixed sex groups of men and women, men are more likely to help a male victim, and with mixed race groups, people are slightly more likely to help someone of their own race, particularly if the victim appears to be a victim of their own behaviour. Overall, there was found to be no evidence of diffusion of responsibility, with larger groups of people being more likely to result in someone providing help compared to a smaller group. The researchers concluded that when people are not able to escape from an emergency situation, they're more likely to provide help. Piliavin suggested that people conduct a cost versus reward analysis of the situation before offering to help a victim, which involves the following. A person observes the emergency situation, which creates a state of emotional arousal that they find unpleasant in the form of fear, disgust, or sympathy. The level of arousal that the person feels is higher if they emphasize more with the victim, they are closer to the emergency, the emergency continues without help for a period of time, the longer no help is provided, the higher the arousal. This level of arousal can be reduced in a number of ways, including by helping the victim directly, going to get help from someone else, leaving the scene of the emergency, and deciding that the victim doesn't need help or isn't deserving of it. Pilly Avin's model therefore concludes that helpers in the experiment didn't help out of pure altruism, but through a motivation to reduce unpleasant feelings of arousal. According to the model, the cost of helping an individual can include embarrassment or physical harm, and the rewards of not helping can include getting on with your own business and not having to deal with a potentially time-consuming emergency situation. Costs of not helping include self-blame and the disapproval from others, 
and rewards of helping include praise from onlookers, the victim, and oneself. Evaluations. One of the strengths of Piliavin's study is that the sample was relatively large, and can therefore be considered representative of the area in which it was studied, and therefore has external validity. However, it could be argued that the sample was relatively ethnocentric, since participants were limited to one subway line in New York, during the exact same times on the days the study took place, between 11am and 3pm. This therefore makes it harder to generalise the findings. The study was high in ecological validity since it was a field experiment taking place in the natural environment, so participants didn't know they were being studied and the behaviour reflected how they would react in the real world. A weakness of this is that, as a field experiment, the study had a lack of control over any extraneous variables, which potentially makes it more difficult to replicate the study in the exact same way in the future. The experiment collected both qualitative data, the comments from the passengers, and quantitative data, the number of helpers. An advantage of the study collecting quantitative data is that it is objective, and therefore has high internal reliability and validity, making it easier to analyse the differences between the drunk and blind conditions. However, a limitation of this is that it can be reductionist, because it cannot tell us why a difference might occur. The qualitative data helped to provide some insight into why participants behaved the way they did. However, this was highly subjective and open to researcher bias and interpretation, which therefore reduces the study's internal reliability and validity. Pilly Evans' study had numerous ethical considerations. Despite the fact that no one was physically harmed during the experiment, all of the participants were deceived and no one was debriefed about the fact that they had even taken part in a psychological experiment. It's possible that some participants may have been distressed by what they had witnessed during the study, so the fact that there was no debrief would have meant that any distressed participants would have continued believing that the distress was caused by a real situation. This deception also meant that there was no informed consent that could be provided by participants prior to the beginning of the experiment, and no right to withdraw was given to them.